we're ready to start. Uh, so we have the four presentations from the four different uh, hands-on. We strictly need to stay within 10 minutes. Huh? Yes. So after 10 minutes, you're cut off. Okay. So uh, we don't have it. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ricardo, and he's Luca. We're going to talk about the machine learning hands-on. The first part of the activity was uh, using super vector machines, which basically are used to differentiating data. So we want to categorize uh, a bunch of, of data. This is a very intuitive example. It's only in 2D. And basically, the problem is to use the minimization of the here. Minimization of the distance of the, the hyperplane, which in 2D is a, is a line, to the two categories that you are distinguishing. So first, we used a, what's called a hard margin, which basically you just minimize, minimize the, the distance of, of, the, of, the, of the line itself. But then if you introduce a parameter which is called C, it's basically you are penalizing how, uh, this, how the, um, the distance of the elements that don't fit better to your line. So moving this parameter C or changing the value, you just say how bad it is for your minimizing function to have some values close to your separating line, which is the yellow here. So uh, you can underfit or overfit your system. Basically, if you use a really high C, you say that uh, you have to take into account all of your points. So you see that every single point falls between the corresponding section of, the, of, your, of your plane. And here, with a, with a low value of C, you say, OK, I'm more flexible in, in my model. So, so some values might be you know, in the wrong category. But in the end, we find this to be more accurate, because here is a clear uh, example of an overfitting. Because just this single value, which is not mm, typical compared to the rest of its category, it's significantly influencing the entire, the entire classification. Uh, in case the, the data is not linearly, uh, uh, linearly separable, as, as in the previous slide, we use a mathematical tool, which is called the, the kernel function. And basically, what it does is to change your, the minimizing function. The minimizing function, you are just using it in a, in a, different, uh, in a hard, higher order of, of dimensions. So a really simple example, we use the Gaussian function. And uh, we have, we used a dummy example. We created two clusters of, of data and calculated the covariance matrix here of, of, this, uh, of these two data. Covariance matrix just shows how the, each data is uh, related to the other one. The parameter of interest is sigma, which basically says, as you all know, how, like how your Gaussian distribution is. So the higher the sigma, the more, the more spread out your distribution is, and therefore the more similar all the data are going to be one, one to each other. Um, now, here we can see some just general examples of uh, underfitted and overfitted uh, cases. Here, the main difference, of course, is that the, the, the space is not linearly divisible, as in the first slide. So here we can see uh, just let's, let's, let's say like the, the standard case where the, the hyperplane that it's dividing the two sections is like correctly distinguishes between both categories. Here is a really low value of, of C. And we see that it's so flexible that it's not accurately predicting or ac accurately classifying the, the both categories. And here is the opposite example. We reduced sigma, meaning that our Gaussian distribution is like really, um, it's not spread out. It's like really constrained into the, to the mean value. So here we see that it's completely over constrained and overfitted, sorry. Here we can see a, a separation that doesn't make any sense. So now Luke is going to talk about a, a practical application of, of this tool. Yeah, mm, we applied the, this concept to some cardiac data. The, here we, we can see some cardiac shape divided by healthy cardiac shape and patho pathological cardiac shape. Here there are an example of a healthy cardiac shape and a pathological. We identified as a parameter the oscillation in the curvature over the mean curvature of the first, uh, the, the left side of the, the curve, and uh, 
here the results as we see the the data uh, are quite linear separable and in fact uh, we try to separate linearly but um, here we use a high c that means uh, hard uh, hard edges uh, but we even with a high c we fail to 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 get an harder behavior instead uh, with a lower c we perfectly divided the, the, the data in healthy pathological um, with a soft behavior and uh, we try also with a uh, kernel trick so with uh, a Gaussian function dividing and better dividing the healthy from pathological here we test uh, with a cross validation with uh, dividing the data in five interval and training with four and testing uh, the other one. And we see the, the accuracy of the, the, the testing uh, in with, uh, depending on C. And if we, we with an higher C, uh, that means a hard, harder behavior, the accuracy reach a plateau. Instead, uh, sigma, with sigma we had uh, very strange behavior. In some cases, uh, uh, with an higher sigma, we reach a high, a lower accuracy. In some other cases, there is a, a plateau, so the accuracy don't get down significantly with an higher sigma. So let's Ricardo see the other part. The second part of the hands-on was using PCA, principal component uh, analysis. And basically, when you have some data, you want to obtain the representative uh, vector. It's called the eigenvectors, but it's basically the main directions or the main parameters that characterize your, your data. So here, we, we can see that the, obviously this is a, the most intuitive example, is always in, in 2D. We see that all this uh, cloud of data are mainly varying along this axis, the uh, U1. It says the problem is to maximize the variance along this vector. And we see that, uh, on the contrary, over U2, the, um, the variance is, is minimum. This means that the, the main information of this set of, of data is given by this, uh, this uh, vector. And the value of associated with this uh, vector, is called the, the eigenvalue, quantifies how important this direction is. So obviously, uh, the eigenvalue associated with uh, the first eigenvector is going to be much higher than the one associated to, to the second one. The problem, as you all know, is that when we deal with uh, data from the real world, especially with, uh, in clinical applications, our data set is not as good as we would, as we would want it to be. So an example we used is uh, uh, data for uh, arrhythmia detection. So the, the data set we used uh, was not very good because we had only around 450 patients divided into around 280 uh, dimensions, 280 labels. No? And um, most of, m a lot of the data was uh, even missing, so we had to disregard those, those uh, values, let's say. So when we get the, the covariance matrix of this data set, we see that there are many interactions and we can't, we can't really see any significant group in, in a, slow, a, slow number, a small number of, of categories, as we, as we saw in the first example, where it was clearly separated in, in two groups. No? So once we use the PCA, which applied to this 280 uh, dimension case, we um, we chose first a K of 10, so basically selecting the 10 dimensions more significant. And when, when we tried to plot different cases of interaction just in 2D or even 3D, we saw that it's really difficult to, to see a, a clearly separable uh, uh, dimension. No? So here, Luke is going to talk to you about the practical use or the, the effective way in which we consider how many dimensions is significant for our, for our case. Here we can see two different ways, but in, in, set, yeah, in just one way and two ways to look uh, at it, because here we have the skew plot, so the, the eigenvalues over the, the, the dimension, as we see the, the first is the, the main, the principal component, uh, is the higher one, and as we increase the dimension, the eigenvalues go down, as Ricardo said. And 
we see that the eigenvalues approach to zero. So the dimension here are, are not effectively uh, on the problem. Here in more in this value, as we see the 90% percent of information reached with the 78 mm, dimension that we see, uh, we, we can see it in this plot because at more or less uh, eight iteration, we reach the 19%. Of course, we reach a plateau. The, it, this has normalized um, a plot, to, so we reach the 100 percentage. But um, uh, we, we can see that uh, with an higher dimension, uh, there's no many information. We, we reach the total information even with uh, a lower dimension problem. Here we test the ac accuracy with a dimension reduction. The red dot is the model without the dimension reduction. As we see, the model is not uh, the, as, as good as we expect because the, the accuracy is uh, around 75%. Uh, and um, as we see in the previous slide, we reach a plateau. And with uh, the dimension, when we reach the plateau, uh, about the information, we reach also the maximum accuracy, reaching more or less 75%. This is uh, only one, uh, uh, one plot about uh, one value of C and one value of sigma. Of course, it can be interesting to uh, evaluate the, the, the influence of the parameter C and the parameter sigma on this, on this accuracy uh, with and without the model reduction. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Any quick question? Otherwise, the next one can prepare. Next one. Next one. Any questions in the meantime? So in general, what did you think about the practical sessions? Did you, did you learn something from it? Yeah. Did you get a different yeah. insight in how to do it? It was really interesting because use the microphone. It was the first time we we used the machine learning, and we found it really interesting. So we encourage anyone who hasn't used it before to to take a look to it because we really liked it. Okay, so we go to the next group. Just go to the presentation. I just I can also on this. It's a fine point. Okay. <laughs> Sorry to spoil. <laughs> yeah. So, so hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, I will be presenting the second, the second um, hands-on project, which is called um, Hemodynamic Lumped Models Using CML and OpenCORM, um, delivered by Eric and Gabriel. <laughs> Um, so, um, this project has mainly as objectives uh, to create a lumped model, to create, um, so to use lumped models uh, to simulate the cardiovascular <laughs> system in general, and also to um, simulate the functioning of the ventricle and um, the output of the ventricle in the blood circulation. And for that, um, so, uh, the wind castle model was uh, used as the base model, like the conceptual model, um, and also um, other features which will be explained later on. 
So the hands-on uh, basically uh, focus on two problems. The first problem was uh, to use uh, a lumped system based on the Windcastle model, as I explained, just to model the blood circulation in general. And sorry, and for that, um, uh, it took into account uh, certain parameters, such as the resistance at the aortic artery. The, the compliance of the aortic artery, um, which is like the amount of blood that it can take in, more or less, um, and also the peripheral resistance, which is the peripheral, the, the resistance at the, the other blood vessels where the blood will flow, and also um, takes into account um, an inertial uh, term because which tries to um, to uh, um, simulate the effect of the blood only coming in out, outwards of the heart and not inwards. So this was already explained in during some of the talks, so you're, I guess, already familiar with it. Um, so no need to, for further explanations. And um, this can be translated into some, uh, let's say, simple equations, which um, were then um, applied into the model. Um, the, second, the second problem was a little bit more complex, and um, it, used, again, the Windcastle model uh, alongside with a PCS model and some other constitutive equations which attempted to uh, incorporate the effect of the contraction of the, of the cardiac muscle, which is translated into this, uh, by the sarcomere behavior and calcium dynamics, which are what were considered the main factors affecting the contraction. And also takes into effect an actual geometry of the ventricle, which in this case was assumed to be spherical for simplicity reasons. So, um, as I mentioned, this project uh, were uh, simulated and modeled in using OpenCore, which is um, an open source uh, platform uh, for solving LDEs uh, and to um, simulate, um, such as in this case, lump systems, but also can, sim can be used to simulate cells and other types of, of, of biological systems. This is how it looks like. The platform, it was developed um, at the University of Auckland, as also has been mentioned before. Um, so in this platform, uh, at least what we've done on the hands-on was basically to code, to, to create a code by defining, uh, declaring some variables, which will be uh, the model parameters and model constants, um, then uh, writing the constitutive and all the equations, and then uh, running the simulation, so compile and save, and then out, uh, output the results in graphs, in nice, gra nice looking graphs. Um, and C CML, just as a matter of fact, is um, kind of a text file uh, where this, this code is written and it can be translated into basically um, an XML file, which can also be used for in other applications. So it's one of the advantages of using this platform. So moving on, um, the results of the first exercise, as I explained, the first exercise was just a simple model of the blood circulation using that simple lumped, mo lumped model. And um, in this exercise, we inputted a sinusoidal, a sinusoidal fl uh, flux, flux signal, let's say. Um, and he, the, here is the result of the, the output. So also it follows, uh, more or less um, a sinusoidal shape, so it's, uh, it makes sense. <laughs> um, and um, he, uh, so the exercise asked us to change some parameters and see what happens uh, to the, what happens to the signals. So firstly, um, we, we for example we can change the peripheral resistance, which is RP, what uh, was RP in the system. And what happens is that we see that there is um, a change in the value here. So I cannot really read what is written there, <laughs> sorry. But um, uh, this will increase because of the increased resistance. And also uh, when you change the heart rate, um, the, the, peaks, the peaks of the, of the pressure will also come further together. Uh, because, well, the cycles increase. So this is pretty um, what was expected from the, from the code. Uh, on the second uh, exercise, um, we had to test other parameters because the model was more complex. 
And uh, um, so here is a, a first overview of uh, what is like the, the output of a normal cycle. So, uh, and the things that we will be looking at. So this is the PV look, this is the, the flux along, and this is the pressure along the cycle, sorry. And this is like the, the pressure, the pressure in the atrium, the pressure in the aortic and the pressure in the ventricle and how they are related. Um, so things that we change, we change the, the heart rate and um, as expected, so by, um, so by increasing the heart rate, which created a decrease in the QT interval, and which can be seen here, um, as expected. Um, and also, uh, here, um, yeah, you see also the pressure follows the same. So you, have, you get the same number of peaks on both the, the flux and pressure, so as expected. Um, also, on another, uh, for the, later on, uh, we also change the, this parameter, which is uh, the rate of calcium uptake. So as I explained, the model tries to, encom to um, compens the effect of, of the calcium dynamics on the model. So this calcium dynamics is translated by this, uh, by this parameter here. And when you change it, like you can increase it or decrease it. In this case, we decreased it because we were uh, simulating fetal hearts. Um, and what happens uh, is that when you decrease the the calcium rate uptake, this signal becomes, uh, well, let's say, slower. So there is, um, the it takes a longer, a longer time and there is like a smoothing here of the signal and also this peak, this peak increases relative to the normal, to the normal cycle. Um, Um, lastly, there was uh, another exercise uh, where um, we had to reproduce this, um, this uh, echo from a, from a disease patient uh, whose disease we didn't know yet, so we had to guess and to rep try to replicate this. And does, can anyone uh, guess what, what this could be? I think it was already mentioned anyway in one of the talks, but. <laughs> okay, so um, this is a signal from a patient with um, aortic stenosis. And um, so we had like to understand what's going on and change the necessary parameters in the model to try to replicate this behavior. So for that, uh, we could basically use two approaches. So either to, um, Increase the peripheral resistance, uh, which, well, as you know, the, when, when you have aortic stenosis, uh, there is kind of a blockage, so the, um, there will be a, a greater resistance uh, in the out, out, outflow of the, of the blood from the aortic valve. Um, so you can increase this, this parameter in the model. Um, and um, there's, well, conversely, also uh, an increase in the aortic pressure. So you can also uh, multiply the, the constitutive equation by, um, by a value. And what you see is that uh, the PV loop from the normal, from the normal, uh, from the normal cycle, um, it becomes a little bit uh, more narrow and uh, the, the, the pressure increases. So you, sorry, you cannot, it's not really possible for, uh, we could not really put them both on the same graph so that you could see them on the same scale. So we, uh, we had to, you have like to look at the values so that you can actually have a comparison between the two, the two loops. But what happens is that this loop will become a little bit more narrow and will, uh, the, the maximum value will increase uh, because of this, of this effect of the increased resistance. And also what you observe on the velocity or flux um, output is that um, this, uh, this phase here, so the filling phase becomes uh, more symmetrical and less uh, less uh, steep compared to the to the normal to the normal uh, to normal cycle, because of the the heart needs to make a greater effort, and therefore the filling phase will take more time. <laughs> Um, so this is basically the results we had. It was a very, very sorry. It was a very um, short overview. <laughs> there was uh, unfortunately uh, not much time to actually look into detail into, um, 
look at these things into detail, so this is a very shallow overview. Um, but anyway, the hands-on was hands-on, <laughs> and uh, we really liked it. The exercise uh, or the people that were coordinating it? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. The fetal next. Can we switch to the other computer? Okay. Uh, are there any questions in the meantime? So the fetal person. <laughs> so, come on, guys. You have to learn to be efficient with presentations also. Normally presenters come and sit in the front row in order to get ready immediately and not have to crawl around. <laughs> okay, next please. Uh, okay, good afternoon to everybody. So I'm going to talk about the third hands-on session, which is, which is leading modeling the fetal circulation and it's safe with placenta abnormalities. Um, how does this work? Okay, the, the main purposes of this hands-on session was, first of all, to study global hemodynamics in the fetal circulation using a zero lamped parameter model, which is based on the, on the fact that the flow in a compliant vessel can be, as my partner said before, that can be, anal can be analogous to, a, to the current of, of, an electric, of an electrical circuit. Then we can cha change several parameters in order, to, in order to simulate the fetal circulation and then we will have an electrical circuit which, which somehow simulates this, somehow simulates this, this flow and the, and the fetal circulation through it. Uh, once we have the, the circuit and the, and the simulations, we will, we will investigate some critical parameters of flow, of flow distribution in health and very specific diseases. And then we will compute subject specific parameters based on, on in vivo measurements. We have the, here the equivalent circuits of our fetal circulation. We have simplified it, simplified it somehow because we, because it is, it is really hard to simulate of the fetal of the fetal circulation with all the aortas, capillaries, and so on. But somehow we have we have divided the the real circuit in five uh, in five main compartments, which are the ascending aorta, the cerebral arteries the descending aorta and the, cor the corresponding vascular beds for each one. In order to do so, we have modeled it by means of, by means of simulink, and then, voila, we have the blood flow for a, he for a healthy fetus. Uh, we have the, the brain flow represented, represented as blue, and then we have the lower body, body flow represented as red. Uh, then, we have extrapolated the blood, the blood flow for, a, for the last bit in order to ensure that the flow has been, uh, has been clearly established, uh, established around the circuit. And then, as an extra, we, can, we have calculated the pulsatility in index, which is of relevant importance for the, for the clinicians because it's, a, uh, because it's a measure of the variance of the, of the variance of the blood flow in the in the fetal circulation. By the way, in an engineering point of view, it's no more than the maximum, maximum value and minus the minimum value over the mean of that. And then, and then we will calculate the pulsatility, indi pulsatility index and we will do a, a several, compa several comparison with the healthy fetus and, and very specific diseases because here everything is wonderful and the, fet and the fetus is right, and here we have very consistent res results, but what happens wha when there are some placental anormalities and very specific diseases? For example, intrauterine growth restrictions. Uh, mm, concretely, in, this, in these diseases, in intrauterine growth restrictions, there, are, there is some kind of placenta insufficiency which restricts somehow the diffusion of, oxy of oxygen and nutrients to the, to the fetus. Uh, as a consequence, the placenta resistance increases, 
and the blood flow in the circulation is, re is reducted and redistributed in the, between the brain blood flow and the peripheral organs, and the peripheral organs. Because when the blood flow in circulation is, is, reduct is reducted, the, the heart will try to increase the, the blood flow into the brain because it is the, mm, more, imp is the more important organ. And because blood flow has to be, has to be constant with, among this circuit, when one goes up, the other goes, the other goes down. That is no more than that. Then, in order to do so, we have increased the placental resistance up to 100% of this original value, which is uh, increased the placental resistance twice as normal. And then we have the blood flow. For, we have extrapolated, as before, the blood flow for the, for the last bit. We have here the, blood, the brain flow and the, lower and the lower body. And we have seen as a result the blood, that the blood flow in brain has increased and the blood flow in lower body decreases according to what, it, to what expected before, the, before taking the measurements. Then we will have gone as one step further and simulated the one cerebral vasodilation in which the, the radius of cerebral arteries and capillaries have increased uh, and 10% uh, of its maximum value. We have, change, we have changed the, this parameter of the brain vascular beds in this, in this circuit, and here we are the blood, the blood flow which corresponds to that. And here, and here we have seen that the, that the brain flow, because of the cerebral vasodilation, has increased quite a lot, whereas the lower body flow has, has decreased as a, as a consequence. Mm, there, then we will have we have simulated very specific scenarios in which we have several types of of vasodilations and um, increases of placenta resistance. And here we have seen that the more vasodilated and the more and the more resi placenta resi resistance is increased, the more flow goes to the brain and the less goes to peripheral organs as, as expected before. Mm, then we will have um, recorded the, uh, the five um, more specific measurements of each, or at least the most, the most common ones, in which placental resistance decreases up to this percentage, and the cerebral vasodilations in increase up to this percentage. Then we will have simulated the 25 possible scenarios, cor scenarios corresponding to that. And then we will have we have um, extracted the more specific one specific ones, which are the 25 percent placental resistance increase and 10 percent vasodilation, 25 percent and 50 vasodilation, I think, and 125 percent and 10 percent vasodilations. Here we can see the how blood flow is is redistributed uh, according to the parameters that we change. Then, as, as told before, before, because pulsatility index is as important for clinicians, we have extracted a 3D plot in which we, in which we have extracted the more the values of pulsatility index as a function of the increase of, of placenta resistance and percentage of vasodilations. And here we can see that pulsatility index in, increase with the more that we increase placenta resistance as expected where vasodilation decreases uh, implies an increase of pulsatility in index. And as an overall effect, we, can, we have concluded that vasodilation effect is greater than placenta resistance, in, at least in the brain. Whereas in the lower body, because, because the blood flow is, de is decreasing, the more, we, the more we change the parameters according to the, to the diseases, we have seen the other way, we have seen the other way around that the pulsatility index increase, increase, whereas we increase the placenta resistance, and the more, and the more we increase the vasodilation, but that in, and in this case, the vasodilation effect is also greater than placenta resistance effect. Well, here we, we have calculated the mo simulated the most possible scenarios and the most practical ones, but, but in reality, this, we have 
we have to take into account the, the real clinical data. data. In order to do so, we have simulated a, a real do Doppler measurement of the, of the blood flow in which, we have in, in which we have included some kind of noise. And then by means of a minimization algorithm, we have, the, we have calculated the optimization and how the mean square error between the simulated data and the values corresponding to the real, to the real flow. And then we have included these parameters to change and this minimization algorithm we cal will calculate the parameters of filter circulation and we will have a clue about what parameters of filter circulation have changed according to the according to that of a healthy fetus. Then in our, as a conclusion we have in, we have included that this anal this analogy with, between electrical circuit and and filter circulation can can be suce can successfully improve the understanding of hemodynamic changes under different conditions for a specific patient, and will allow us, and will allow us to, for compute, to compute parameters that cannot be measured experimentally. And I think that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And what did you think about a hands-on? Or what did your group think about a hands-on? What did your group think about a hands-on? Also that the trainer was handsome, or? Of course, of course. <laughs> OK, the next one. Last but not least, uh, I'm going to present the last hand-on project, the musculoskeletal one. So, um, oh, thank you. Our project aim was um, aimed to study the um, mechanical and biological effects that also that um, are involved in the process of osteoarthritis. Specifically, uh, osteoarthritis uh, involves uh, um, affects a big part of the population, especially in uh, 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 increasingly elder population, and uh, is expected that uh, the amount of people and uh, the resources involved to treat this disease will increase in time. Osteoarthritis is a disease that um, affects cartilage and bone and uh, uh, develops in time, leading to a thinner, thinning of the cartilage an inflammation process, uh, pain in the patients, and especially age-related pr uh, mobility problems. So we were giving a, uh, a complex finite element uh, knee, total uh, knee model, which was composed of two rigid bodies, simulating the uh, tibial head and the, fib, uh, and the femur and uh, several deformable bodies, including the cartilage, the menisci, and the ligaments. So uh, first, we uh, visualized this model in uh, FIBIO, which is an open source model um, software for um, finite element analysis. And once we got, uh, uh, we got to know this, this software, we moved to, um, to study what is the mechanical properties of the cartilage, so how to uh, implement a uh, um, realistic model, for, uh, realistic equations for the properties of the cartilage, and how um, to correlate the mechanical effects on the biological behavior of cells within the cartilage. Especially, we want to see um, if loads within uh, physiological range or above will lead to either a degeneration of the cartilage or uh, uh, increase in matrix production. The biphasic model was the most representative one because the cartilage has a really high water content and um, it's made of collagen, fibers, and protoglycans. The protoglycans will uh, show, uh, will present a fixed charge which will lead to uh, an increased concentration of electrolytes and therefore an osmotic pressure within the cartilage. The increasing pressure is balanced by the force within the fibrils and the protoglycans. 
And um, so we wanted to model this biphasic structure with a neo ockham equation and a Donan model to um, express the, the osmotic pressure. Uh, we want to correlate then these two structure, these two models and analyze the overall properties of the cartilage um, behavior. We build a simulation with the finite element model, uh, starting from uh, building the equations, getting the values from literature. We included these values in the cartilage, in the material properties in the, in the software, and then uh, we run the finite element simulation. From this model, we managed to get the strain within the cartilage, the highest value, and use it to analyze the biological effect. This whole process is iterative, so the changes in protoglycans and collagen content, as well as cell viability, can be used to change the parameters of the equations, and therefore study uh, the development either of a, a chronic condition or a physiological model. We run first a um, simulation using a hyperelastic model for the cartilage. So here we have a, a video of the total displacement of the joint on which was applied a, um, a load of 500 newtons. And below uh, you see uh, uh, what we got so far with the biphasic model. Unfortunately, the <coughs> second part didn't really run as expected, so we could only uh, visualize the free swelling of the cartilage. So what happens uh, when there's no load applied and w there's a water intake with the cartilage till the point that it reach, uh, the, um, the structure reaches an, equi an equilibrium. Um, no. So, well, from, from the uh, first model, we struck, as I said, the strain, and this was used in the second group part of the project for the biological model. Well, um, in this part of the project, uh, we try to get uh, the values of the properties of the cartilage, uh, taking the data that they have uh, obtained on the uh, low model. So. And for determining these values, we take uh, several equations. We have the <laughs> and equations are for cytokines, for the uh, GAG, uh, for collagen, and for the growth factor. Um, also, uh, in this kind of uh, damage, the MMPs has a uh, main role, so uh, we include another equation for control the growing of the substance that uh, creates the degeneration of the collagen. So, um, in this first uh, graphic, you can see that when the MMPs are low, the collagen and the growth factor are at a higher level, but when the MMPs grow, we get a decrease of the cartilage, uh, the collagen, sorry and the growth, uh, the, the growth factor. So um, the problem with this model was that we are getting a cyclic behavior, and that's not the kind of behavior that really we get, uh, we get in the uh, knee joint. So uh, this means that some of the parameters that we have tried to use for describing the process uh, are given a negative aging value in the matrix. So uh, after trying change then, uh, we decided to make uh, a correction factor uh, for getting the correct uh, graphic and allow you to see what's the real behavior of the knee joint under this stress. So um, for simplify, we just uh, take a one plus concentration uh, division and this is the behavior that really should have this kind of model. Uh, as you can see, here we take a point uh, where we have a um, low value of the MMPs and the cartilage, I mean, sorry, the collagen has high level. When we decrease, the, we increase the value of the MMPs, we see that the collagen decreases. And with these values, uh, we should take the results for uh, the data that they should implement as the uh, properties of the material and run again 
the simulation, take another data, and reintroduce them in the in these equations. Uh, the problem is uh, we couldn't do such an iterative uh, process. So these are the uh, first step, the initial step, and the last step. Uh, what we get in the last point. So. So in conclusion, um, even though the old system was built to be an iterative model within between uh, the mechanical structure of the knee and the biological behavior within the cartilage, we only could make only a part of it. And um, well, taking it, <coughs> we want to thank Jerome and uh, the rest of the group for uh, allowing us to visualize this model and try it with our uh, with our hands. And yeah, well, that was as far as we got. <laughs> okay, perfect. That uh, I think all of the projects were challenging. Some were a little bit more simplified, but I think all of them show what you need to do as a modeler, which are the challenges, both in the software, the equations, how to implement things. So, okay, I thank you all for participating in it. I hope you learned a lot from it. And now the bus is waiting, so we have to run to go and visit the synchrotron. Right, uh...